Three-year-old Maxim and two-year-old Dima lived in one of the villages in the Altai territory. They never saw their dad. However, their mother was also seen infrequently. The woman left her kids alone, running away on a date to the next gentleman. One day, a neighbor noticed that it was painfully invisible near the mother's house for a long time and called the police. A group arrived at the call which, in addition to the juvenile affairs officer, included police warrant officer Sergei Sherikov a former riot policeman who had visited hot spots four times. When we entered the house, my heart clenched, recalled Sergei. I've seen a lot, but that's the case these days. In the frozen house, a window was broken, which three-year-old Maxim plugged with things so as to not blow. But it's March. No pillows, no curtains, no groceries. The eldest of the kids, Dima, saved the only loaf that he and his brother had. He gave Dima a little bit to nibble on the bread and then hid the loaf. He didn't know how much more they would have to sit alone. To warn his brother, he wrapped him in mattresses. My hand immediately ran through my head. I'll take them. And aloud, I said, Will you go with me? And then Max, hearing the word, shouts, Dad! And how could I not recognize you right away? I get goosebumps running down my hands, and tears are coming up. It's impossible to remain indifferent here. Still worried, Sergei the policeman said. It turned out that the brothers sat in a cold house for six days. If it were not for the vigilance of the neighbor, it's not known whether they would have been saved. The boys were immediately taken to the hospital, treated, washed, and, of course, fed. Sergei called his wife, Elena, and told her about the foundlings. The next morning, they went together to visit the boys in the hospital, picking up fruit and toys. I immediately realized that this was serious as soon as Sergei called, said Elena. Our young son was only a year old at the time, and Elena had three daughters from a previous marriage, and coming home, the husband simply did not find a place for himself. He sits, silent, drowning in his thoughts. Let's take them, Len, was not discussed. The couple immediately bought clothes for the children, since they had nothing at all. Elena, with a one-year-old child in her arms, went around all the offices and stood in more than one line to collect all the papers for adoption. The children began calling mother and father of Sergei and Elena in the hospital. Now Maxim is five years old, Dima is four, Max thinks like an adult, in everything he copies Papa Sergei. He sees a flower, immediately picks it and brings it to me, Elena laughs. He brings a chair and puts it next to me so that he can sit down and rest. He always informs me to take care of myself and have lunch on time, Elena says. She also says that Max always says to her the following, You know, Mom, I'll be like our dad, I'll have a big family, a home, and I'll never leave my children. In another similar and heartwarming story, this Pittsburgh cop saved two boys from abuse, then adopted them. A veteran detective who helps at a boxing gym for inner-city children, Jack Mook, described adopting Josh and Jesse as the best thing he's ever done in his life. At the Steel City Boxing Association, a nonprofit gym that pairs coaching mentors with inner-city youths, Jack Mook, a Gulf War veteran and retired Pittsburgh police detective, met brothers Josh and Jesse Lyle in April 2007. During his time as a basketball coach for the boys, Jack, age 45, discovered some alarming truths about their horrific upbringing. In addition to the fact that their parents were drug users, the family also resided in an area where drug trafficking, prostitution, and violence were commonplace. Josh and Jesse were able to find sanctuary in the gym. Josh, in particular, put in a lot of effort almost every day in the gym. Josh describes his five-year experience as an escape from home. By the end of the summer of 2012, however, the lads had given up on attending to the gym. Jack went on a search for them and came upon Josh, who was 13 at the time, after school one week before Christmas. He had bags under eyes and sunken cheeks, and he appeared to be in awful shape. His hair was missing in parts, and he had a rash on the back of his neck, among other things. In his conversation with Jack, Josh revealed that social services had removed the boys from their irresponsible parents and placed them in foster care with an aunt and an uncle. However, Josh claims that their new home was plagued with mice, bugs, and fleas, and that their guardians peddled narcotics while hitting and screaming at the boys. Because their guardians were concerned about their nephew's affiliation with a police officer, they barred them from going to the gym. I just wanted to sleep away the rest of my life, Josh admits. Jack returned home with the thought, I've got the whole house to myself, what exactly am I doing? He spoke with a caseworker from the Office of Children, Youth, and Families about assuming custody of the boys, but she responded that they were fine according to the standards of the agency in question. Two weeks later, the boy's uncle was apprehended by the police on suspicion of heroin possession. Upon learning of the situation, Jack contacted a high-ranking official in the Pittsburgh court system 
who placed him in touch with the boy's family court attorney. Following completion of the necessary background checks on Jack, the court placed Josh and Jesse in foster care with him on February 5, 2013, according to court records. It was the most relieved I've ever felt in my life, Josh recalls. Jesse, at 11 years old, has excelled in school under Jack's guidance, and Josh aspires to attend a military institution and eventually join the Special Operations Forces. Both were champions in their respective weight classes in the Pennsylvania Western District Golden Gloves, a prominent boxing event in 2014. Their success was likely boosted by their daily diets of meat and vegetables, which they consumed on a daily basis. Josh had a 1-8 record before this. It's 7-2 right now, Jack reports. I believe I may have accidentally given the youngster some food. Because the boys were doing so well, Jack decided to adopt them in September. When Josh was driving to the courthouse, he was worried that his aunt and uncle might interfere with the proceedings and prevent the adoption from going through as planned. The largest smile appeared on Josh's face as the judge pronounced Jack the boy's adopted father. According to the judge, I knew it was permanent and I knew it would lead to a happy life for my brother and me, Josh explains. Jack finds fatherhood both joyful and humiliating in equal measures. They're my best buddies, he adds of his companions. There's just no way I'm going to allow someone to harm them again. The cost of caring when aiding others who are suffering is referred to as compassion fatigue in police officers and other individuals in caregiving professions. Officers are frequently placed in circumstances where they must provide emotional support to victims of crime, survivors of natural catastrophes, or victims of other horrific occurrences. Police officers and other first responders serve as sources of order, knowledge, and support for people who have been traumatized by traumatic occurrences. Frontline workers who are repeatedly confronted with violent and tragic circumstances may find it difficult to detach from the horrific events they witness, while others may become emotionally detached or numb as a result of their work. The suppression of emotions when cops focus entirely on the investigative aspects of the issue compounds this. In other words, they suffer from compassion fatigue, which can lead to professional burnout as a result of a job-related stressor such as excessive paperwork or lengthy shifts. Individuals drawn to helping professions, on the other hand, find fulfillment in serving others. Compassion, satisfaction is evident when there is a sense of commitment to the job and improved well-being. Although it may seem natural that compassion satisfaction would diminish as compassion fatigue develops, it's worth noting the numerous strategies for increasing satisfaction in order to minimize or negate compassion fatigue. When police officers are faced with the inability to alleviate the agony and suffering of others, compassion fatigue develops. Emergent behaviors include alcohol misuse, difficulty controlling anger and disappointments, and isolation from family and friends. Individual pride and communal involvement might be eroded by organizational stresses and public criticism. If left uncontrolled, the consequences could include erroneous use of force choices and hostile or indifferent behavior. Failure to recover from stress can result in physical and psychological problems. Officers who can recognize the importance of their services and care for trauma victims, despite being exposed to overwhelming situations, typically have feelings of compassion satisfaction, which can lead to improved job performance. Officers' health, well-being, and job performance can all benefit from recognizing compassion fatigue and restoring pleasure. Although there are a range of successful self-care approaches, such as emotional regulation, regulated breathing, and mindfulness, officers can benefit to include these techniques in their training. Supervisors can applaud and acknowledge excellent community contacts and officer contributions to increase compassion satisfaction. For those experiencing weariness or professional burnout, Peer support programs, other assignments, and officer rotations from high-risk teams, like child abuse units, could be offered. Community groups can help develop compassion satisfaction by recognizing and thanking officers for their accomplishments. Leadership and administration may set a positive tone and set a principle for officers who are exposed to the suffering of persons in their communities. Compassion satisfaction can be improved by developing a psychological buffer against the negative effects of compassion fatigue. Officers can increase their compassion satisfaction and lessen compassion fatigue by seeking counseling from practitioners who are knowledgeable with police.